Carson, a graduate of the great school, the University of Wisconsin, um, class of 2010. Um, I then went on to do my internship at Colorado State, and now I'm doing my residency at UC Davis. I'm in my second year, so I have another year to go. Um, I have many interests, um, as I'm discovering <laughs> as I move through <laughs> my career, but one of which is definitely um, behavior and enrichment. Um, I think we can all, uh, we all realize that it's what leads a lot of animals into our care, and it's also our responsibility to take care of their behavioral needs while they're in our care. So that is what we're going to talk about today, more what we can do in our shelter. Um, so let's get started. Am I using my... Okay. Okay. So here is what I hope you guys get from me today. Um, we're going to talk about stress. Um, its manifestations in our shelter animals um, and what it can lead to. And then we're going to talk about housing because I love housing. <laughs> it's kind of goofy, but I love it. Um, and then also ways that we can be really creative for enrichment um, for our, our animals. And um, hopefully you'll pick up some fun tips to even use at home. I do a lot of this quirky stuff at home too. So I know from being a student here that you all know these, right? Um, I'm sure they've been mentioned by Dr. Newberry, but you've also, I'm sure, heard about them in your uh, other herd health classes. Um, and these go way back to the 60s, and it was they were designed for farm animals. But I always think about these um, when I'm making any decision in the shelter. Um, so I encourage you guys to think of all the five freedoms as we um, go through our talk today. Um, I think this is just adorable. This is actually a poster that a colleague introduced me to for a boarding facility. Um, it was part of their... Um, marketing. So, so we're talking about shelters. This is a shelter elective, but I also think it's really important to think about all these things in terms of, of veterinary clinics, um, boarding facilities, and any place where you have, you know, doggy daycares, where you have multiple. So, you know, the animal when they get when they get dropped off in an unfamiliar place, they don't know how long they're going to be there. You know. Boarding facility, maybe it's just for a few days versus a shelter where they could be for a while. They don't know if their person's coming back. So we always want um, to realize that we're taking them to a new place and meet all of their needs. Cats, too, probably, could we all admit more so? Um, they love their schedule. Taking them to a new place certainly disrupts that. Um, and I'm sure you guys have heard the term feigned sleep. Cats love to do that. So they may look very peaceful, but they're actually stressed beyond belief, and the only thing they can do is lay there. This cat looks pretty happy. I'm not saying that that's what this cat is doing, uh, but something that we'll, um, um, we'll talk about. Here we go. Who's seen this as you walk through a shelter? It breaks my heart. Um, there's really nothing. Um, these are hard for me to look at. They're really, really, really hard for me to look at. And I think as veterinarians, you know, if one of these animals was sick, um, and not maybe stressed, we would pick up on it and we'd know what to do. You know, that's what our training is about. That's why we're all here. Um, and we have a plan and we soap them and uh, we come up with all that, but who has a good soap for, for stress, boredom, fear? Um, this is what I really want to focus on so that we can walk through our shelters and not see this. And then, once they get stressed, then as veterinarians, <laughs> We get to deal with their medical issues. So stress can lead to so many things, both behaviorally, but also physically, especially in our poor little cats. I mean, leading cause of URI, you guys heard it from Dr. Hurley, stress. Um, and um, Dr. Hurley likes to talk about when she was an animal control officer, or dog catcher, as she <laughs> likes to call herself. She talks about a cat that has four broken legs. Okay, four broken legs that ran from her because it would rather experience pain than the fear and stress of being caught by a human. So, I think if so, I mean, if that doesn't tell us that we need to address these concerns in our animals, I don't know what does. It's a vicious cycle, right? So, we're talking about stress. So that's going to create more unwanted behaviors, increased disease, and we have less adoptions because 
who wants to adopt a sick, poorly behaved animal. Okay, some of us would. <laughs> Let's all be honest. But your average person, that's not who they're looking for when they enter a shelter. That leads to more animals in our shelter. So we have more crowding. So then we have less time to spend with our animals to give them everything they need to reduce their stress. And once you get in this loop, it's really hard to get out of it. So if we could stop the cycle, we're going to find ourselves um, way ahead of the game. Um, and there was actually a study, I don't know if you guys saw it, um, within the last couple of years from the ASPCA looking at why people um, pick the animals that they do. And one of the leading factors, and I know it, it's not necessarily <laughs> the most important place to start, but it's appearance. And even, you know, how much a uh, person would play with, an, um, how much one of the animals would play with their toys. And so, again, if we can make our animals, you know, if they're comfortable and they look great, they're going to move out the door. So, um, all things that um, um, get us out of this vicious cycle. But, don't just want to be depressing. That is so not my style, if you know me. So we want to think about it, that it's a dose effect, which I know you guys have talked about in terms of infectious disease, that animals can cope with some stress, right? They're in a shelter. We have to just accept that fact. And so we have to realize what we can control and what we can't. Just like when we're cleaning, you cannot create a sterile environment, but you can certainly decrease the, decrease the infectious dose that an animal is exposed to. So keep the stress minimal so that the animals can stay at a place where they can still cope. Because once they fail to cope, we're in the cycle and it's much harder to get out of it. So manage what you can and accept what you can't. And it starts at the beginning. I'm sure you guys have all seen this picture of Dr. Hurley. What could she have done for this poor cat? And she'll fully admit it. Yeah, a towel. A towel. She's got great enrichment for the dog. <laughs> However, the cat, not so much. So cover them up. So think about it in every stage of as the animal moves through. Um, you should always be accessing their behavior. Um, we're not going to get into behavior evaluations today, but do remember that's just one snapshot in time. So we want to think about the animal the whole time they're moving through our facility, both ways that we can reduce their stress, but also make observations about what their um, temperament is. I think this is really important. I love this little poster. But make sure staff is trained. Um, not necessarily just using this poster, but have a good um, training so that your staff can recognize stress, pain, and suffering, as well as the you know the medical issues that we um, that we all know about. Because if this if the stress goes unnoticed, it's not going to be recognized, and it's just going to get worse. We're back in the cycle. So um, have resources for your staff that recognizes behaviors and stress. And also, um, I was just helping a shelter with a training manual on um, safely and low stress animal handling that can make a difference as well. Um, we now are starting to have multiple studies that look at stress um, and its relationship to different things in the shelter. This was one that um, uh, looked at weight loss stress and upper respiratory disease. Because you know, there's a lot of things that we can say this happens, but it's great when we can show it um, in research. I mean, we all know stress causes URI. Um, but when we have studies that show it, um, we get a lot more support from people in making changes, which is awesome. So it's probably not going to surprise you that um, cats are stressed. They stop eating. They stop eating. They lose weight. As they lose weight, they're more at risk of developing URI. So keep them unstressed. Keep them eating. Keep them healthy. Easy, right? Simple. Simple, simple. simple. So these are the things we want to talk about in our housing basics. Again, doing all these things to help them meet their five freedoms. And because I feel like many times our poor cats have it worse, we're going to start with our cats. OK, who's seen this? And this is probably what most people think of when they think of cat housing and shelters. Stainless steel cage. I don't really know. When I was in this shelter, is this what? Oh, no. Is there a laser pointer? OK, so I'm going to stop trying to use <laughs> And these, these cages blew me away. Like, OK, A, there's no cats. And there's like a litter box. It looks like housing for a litter box. Like, I'm not sure where the cat's supposed to go. Maybe that's what it was. Maybe this was their litter box holding, stray litter box holding. Like, there is nowhere for a cat to go 
in most of these except in their litter box. You know? Like, I, so let's think about this. So we have a standard two by two-ish stainless steel cage, right? And then we want to give our cats a bathroom, which we should think about the size. So we want to have it, you know, one and a half times the length of our cat and wide enough so that they can do their business. We're going to give them food, right? We're going to give them water. And we're going to put the cat in. What's he going to do? Can he do any of his five freedoms? Can he express normal behaviors? Can he even stretch to his maximum stretchiness? No. He can eat and he can go to the bathroom, but that's about it. I'd like to say a famous quote from a one Dr. Sandra Newberry. And I just have to say, I have to agree with her. So, what do our cats need? They need compartments, right? Who wants to eat in their bathroom? Okay, for those of you on the, on the web, no one raised their hand. Um, cats need compartments. They need places where they can sleep and eat away from where they go to the bathroom. So in these over here, I really liked them because they're a top and a bottom. So the, the bathroom's on the bottom, and they can also have a hiding place down there, or they can be up in view. I really like this one because you have the options to open it into four compartments. Um, so you want at least one of the compartments to be 28 by 30, so a nice space where they can fully stretch out um, and do all their cat stuff, play, all that good stuff. Okay, um, and then ideally both compartments would be that big, but if it's not possible, um, a lot of um, kennels are being made with a smaller compartment for their litter box, but it still needs to be big enough for a decent sized litter box and so they can stand up. We'll talk about that later, but these are some of my favorites and I was just working actually in this exact shelter last week. If you guys notice the, um, you see the door handles? They're made of fiberglass, some sort of plastic. Um, that made a huge difference. If any of you guys used a kennel like that, it is awesome when you are opening and closing the door. It doesn't make any noise at all. And it may not seem like a big deal, but if you think about how many times someone, like with, when you're cleaning and feeding and straightening or taking the cat out for a meet and greet, those doors get opened a lot and it's a lot of noise. It is very stressful for cats. So just a simple modification of putting in um, a piece of plastic for the door hinge is Awesome. You can still disinfect it um, when you need to when that cat moves out. But you know, it's little things like that that we can think about um, that make a big difference for this cat. Look at it, look how happy he is there. He is choosing to lay down in his bathroom, but you know, we pass no judgment. Um, and another thing, sorry, I have to throw this out there because I'm a big proponent. So this was a shelter I was at, and the the sad thing about these cats is the public can only go on the side with the pet plexiglass. They can't go on the side with only staff could go on the side with the door where you could interact with the cat. And I think it's been, sadly, a misconception for a long time that we shouldn't let the public interact with our cats because they're going to spread disease. But when I was a vet student, we looked at it and we took my hand and we measured the amount of organic matter on my hand after I pet three cats versus the organic matter that was present on a scrub top of a staff employee. Guess what was dirtier? It wasn't my hand. <laughs> OK? So again, people will choose a cat because it reaches out to them, because of how they interact with the cat. So this is my plug to turn those cages around, let people interact with the cats. Also, enrichment for them. And who wants to look, who wants to, like if there's a staff person on the other side interacting, who, I mean, are you going to adopt a cat butt? And look, that's all we're seeing. So maybe what some people go for, but my guess is the front side will be better. OK, favorite item of all time on my list, portals. Have you guys seen these? Have you seen cages? Have you guys been to Dane County? The Humane Society here in Madison. They're starting to put these in. They're awesome. So before, the cats just got one side. And you remember our demonstration of what the cat looked like. Now, they have two of those. And all they had to do was put in a portal to connect the two cages. It's fantastic. Fantastic. Um, and the, the door that's on there is just used for cleaning, so that you put the cat to one side and you can clean and they won't be in your way. But um, cats love them. Um, and it's very inexpensive to do once you already have the stainless steel cages. All right. Now you would think this isn't something we would have to talk about, but I think we should. Because look, really? <laughs> this, poor, this poor cat. What, what is the problem here? 
he can't he can't posture properly, right? I mean, imagine having to use a toilet that had your ceiling just above the, the seat. Um, not big enough for this poor cat. So really, it may seem like a small point, but put a litter box in um, that the cat can use. We know we need to feed and water, so we need to make sure there's access to it, and we also need to make sure we're watching. Because you can put as much food and water in there every day, but if you're not monitoring to see if they're consuming it, we could have a problem, because the cat could go for days without eating um, before we notice it. So always make sure um, that that's on your radar. Beds. What cat doesn't love a good bed? Um, there was actually a study back in the 90s that found that cats have um, longer periods of REM sleep if they have a soft place to lay down versus a hard surface. And that doesn't mean cats don't like hard surfaces, they just want the choice. So, um, as part of their kennel, they should have a really nice soft bed to lay on. So you can use dog beds, fluffies as they call them at Dane County, fleece is very popular, even towels, There's lots of things that you can use. Um, that can be laundered if it's soiled, but again, um, if this isn't soiled, this cat can keep this bed for his whole stay in the shelter. Hiding places. Another myth that's out there is that if you give a cat a place to hide, that's all they're going to do. True, some cats may. Unlikely that those cats are going to be great options for adopt or great candidates for adoption. Cats want choice, and they actually did a study. Um, it was a Canadian study, and they used these um, hide perch and go boxes. So they gave them to cats, and they looked at their adoptability. Like, were cats more likely to be adopted or less likely to be adopted if they had a hiding box? And they actually found that it did not affect it whatsoever. Um, they saw lower stress scores in the cats with hiding places, which was great. And when cats were given the choice, um, they would choose, when they came out, they chose to be more friendly. But knowing that they had the choice to hide, um, made them much more attractive to adopters. So um, give them a place to hide. Let them choose. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen the Cranda bed. Oh, dogs, you've probably seen dogs that are cran dogs Cranda bed. So they have them for cats as well. Um, and what's really nice about the beds is if you have small cages, because what you don't want to do is give them a hiding spot so that they don't have a choice to be outside of their hiding place. Where here, if if you put the towel on, they can hide, but if they want to, they still have a place to lay on the floor. Does that make sense? But you don't want it to, like, the only thing to be is their hiding box. So um, we have instructions on our website on how to make these, um, the elevated cat beds, because what's nice about that, too, is if you make your own, you can get them to fit the cages that are in your um, shelter. So lots of options for cats. Again, if the cages are small and you don't have the floor space that you need, Covering part of the front of the cage is another great option, so you're not taking up any cage space. But now if this cat chose that they needed a little bit of quiet time, they could be behind their hiding spot. Uh, this is a shelter down in Florida, and they were the cats had the top and bottom again, and so they covered part, they covered where the shelf was. So if the cat wanted to hide, they could go on their shelf. So giving the cats lots of options of where they want to be while they're in there. Um, cage. More options, just depends on the shelter. Oh, and one thing. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> As I'm thinking, the question was if you cover the front of cage, does it dramatically decrease the air quality for the animal in that cage? Um, I would say no. And I wouldn't cover, one thing I want to stress is I wouldn't cover the whole front of the cage. Um, you again want to give them choice. And the thing is, is I would again go with risk versus benefit, and reducing their stress to me is much, um, for the cat is a much bigger benefit than decreasing air quality, because again, what's going to get them sick is going to be their stress. Yeah. <laughs> so, one thing to remember about, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. The question was, um, at a shelter, um, they used the towels um, to cover the cages when the cats were sick to prevent sneezing and droplets on to the cats below them. Um, again, biggest cause, OK, so unlike dogs, um, aerosolization is not the biggest cause of feline URI. It's so it's a, big, it's a big problem with dogs, but not for cats. So 
Um, fomite transmission and stress, again, are going to be big problems. So I would cover part of the front of the cage, again, to reduce stress and provide a hiding place if that is what you need to do for your cats in your shelter. But as a way to stop spread of URI, I know there are other ways that the shelter could go about doing that than covering the whole front of the cage. So they're all sick anyway, right? <laughs> so I mean, it's gonna, yes, but I mean, I would not start suggesting that you cover the front of all sick animals. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. So just one comment. Clean litter box. Clean the litter box. Or I should have mentioned that in. <laughs> um, so uh, Dr. Newberry was saying that if you cover the front of the cage, even half of it, be really good about cleaning the litter box, which you should be anyway, but just be more conscious of it. Um, if, um, how you're providing hiding places is covering the front of your kennel. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> no. Inquisitive ones. Uh, question about letting people interact with cats while they're up for adoption, risk of getting clawed um, from an overzealous cat. Sure, again, risk benefit, right? Um, if you have a cat that you know gets really overstimulated, maybe that's not right out front <laughs> near all the people is where you want to put that cat. So, But I don't think all cats should have to not be allowed to be interacted with because one guy gets over, you know, we're dealing with animals, right? So we have to risk benefit, right? So, and think about each animal and what the best place is going to be for them. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's, okay. Sorry, the question was, do we recognize that people visiting shelters will accept that risk? I think people want to interact with cats. I think it's much more frustrating for people to see cats behind glass that they can't interact with. You know, um, we have to trust that people will be appropriate in their actions with cats. Um, they're going to go home potentially with this animal, right? So um, I think people, what I see is that people get much more frustrated when they can't interact. And signage, signage is a big deal too. I've been in shelters where it's like, you know, there's so many rules that it's really off-putting. It's not welcoming at all. They're like, don't touch, you know, don't open cages, don't, don't, don't. And that is not what people want to see. You know, we want to be like, come in, come meet our animals, find your forever friends. You know, so it really is a marketing thing. Um, is there risk? Are you going to get burned sometimes, potentially? But if people won't even come into your shelter, you're really in trouble. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, so we had a comment that um, um, at a shelter that the student works at, um, they do have the, and I've been there, and it's this is exactly what I've experienced is that there's their glass um, doors, but there's holes in it where you can. I think it's actually there for ventilation. <laughs> I think it's the purpose of it. But it's big enough to stick fingers through. And she hears parents you know, advising kids to be careful with the kittens, but that they love when the cat comes over and they can interact. So 
always got to think of our risk benefit. Okay. Um, other examples of cat housing. Oh, and one, sorry, one thing I wanted to mention before all the questions was how many shelters have you guys been in where the, the housing up front is awesome? Like you see cats and you're like, I'm not going to take this cat home. It's such a beautiful place to live. And then you go in the back and it's a two by two stainless steel cage. So when is the cat going to be the most stressed? Right? Day one, right? Day one to, one to seven or one to, you know, think about your housing the whole time the cat's in the shelter. And I'm not suggesting that you need these beautiful rooms throughout your whole shelter, even though that would be fantastic. Um, Think about the housing that they're in their first couple days. Give them compartmentalized housing from day one. Make the whole stay beautiful. So a lot of times, I'm sure you guys have seen um, rooms like this that have multiple cats in it. That's fine if that is what the cats enjoy. But think about how many. There's, I think you'll find very few cats who like to live with 12 other cats. Um, and that also makes monitoring of behavior and medical needs quite difficult. So a couple cats to a room can be quite enriching for the cats, for the right cats. Um, and still pretty manageable for a shelter. So lots of light, too. I want to stress that. Huge natural light is great um, for all animals. Um, this was a great option that, um, that we saw at a shelter where they were actually using dog kennels. This is actually two different shelters. And I just want to make a note about the one on the right here. Um, OK, your left. <laughs> um, there were dogs out here. OK, and I know we say separation of species, which, again, you have to weigh your options. Look how much room this this cat got. Okay, it's easy, has lots of options. Is able to do many things. Yes, they may have heard a dog bark um, at times, but is this a better option than a stainless steel two by two cage? In my opinion, absolutely. So again, weighing your options. Um, this was actually a shelter um, where they didn't have as many dogs, so they actually had different wards. So they were able to give whole dog wards to the cats. Um, this is an amazing place if you guys ever come to visit us out in Davis. Um, it's called Field Haven. All the cats get indoor-outdoor housing. Some of them are communal rooms. Some of them are for cats that don't like to live with other cats. They get their own walk-in um, um, condo, if you will. So they get indoor-outdoor housing, which works awesome in Central California. Um, and with, I know the wood might be giving you some, some of you the heebie-jeebies that we're putting cats um, with wood, but we have a lot of cleaners now that let us disinfect um, lots of surfaces. So um, if you're going to use other um, products besides stainless steel, that's fine. Just know how to disinfect them. Okay, but when all you have is small, when you don't get to have the beautiful field haven, there's lots of options. Again, the bed, raising the bed, give them um, room above and below, and then start fundraising so you can make your shelter fantastic. Okay, and if you have a cage that looks like this, that's what you get to do with it. Okay, on to our dogs. Um, none of this is appropriate. Um, this was some um, observations that were made um, in uh, multiple different shelters with double-sided housing, even with robust walking programs. So these dogs got out of their kennels. Most of the animals you will see, up to 70%, and I'm even talking puppies, will choose to urinate and defecate away from where they sleep. And you guys can walk through kennel after kennel and see that is where they choose to defecate. It's away from their bedding. And so um, I was in a shelter recently, Bray and I were, and they said, we don't let the dogs have both sides because we don't have time to clean both sides. All right, with these dogs, okay, these are dogs that are vaccinated, they're healthy. Don't clean this side. Tomorrow morning, don't clean this side. Close the door, clean that side, open it up, away you go. There's no more cleaning by giving this dog both sides. But what you are avoiding is now he hasn't soiled his bedding. Yay. We don't have to do that laundry. And he gets to stay here and have a clean area for his whole stay away from his bathroom. Awesome. OK, so double-sided. Um, with cats, we tend to have, because you know cats are kind of the same size, so we have requirements of size for cages for cats, but with dogs it really varies because, you know, the, the five pound chihuahua that I love is much different than the 110 pound Great Pyrenees that my friends love. So have different sizes in your kennel. Again, just make sure they're all compartmentalized. Bedding, they love them. I love these beds. I don't know if you guys have seen them. This is what our local shelter uses. They're the high-sided beds. Um, they're fantastic and they are not expensive. Um, one of my favorites. People love donating beds. The Coranda beds are fantastic. Um, we all know our dogs love their beds. 
Um, dogs also like places to hide. Um, lots of things you can use. That's me covering the front of one side of the dog's kennel. It's just um, contact paper that can stay on the kennel. Um, the high-sided bedding that um, can work as great hiding places. Again, they like choice. Food and water. Another thing to consider, especially if dogs have to be co-housed, is that it needs to be accessible. You guys think this dog can eat? No. There could be six bowls of food in that kennel. He's not eating because of this, because of his companion within his um, uh, within his own housing unit. So something to think about. You can again, you can provide the food and water, but you need to monitor and make sure that it's happening. So that is not providing access to food and water. Choices. Dogs love choices. Lots of different surfaces to land. The choice to be indoor or outdoor. I love this. Dr. Wagner made um, this. It's a you know it's an outdoor garden hose holder. So she just cut a hole in it so he can choose to be inside on top. If a volunteer wants to go in and spend time with him, they can sit on the top. And then when he moves out, it can be disinfected. All right, questions about housing. You guys all know now how to design the perfect shelter, all your animals' needs, or how to retrofit what you already got. Some people, for some dogs, yes. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. The question was, um, when you cover the front of a cage, do you find that it creates jumping for some animals? And I would say yes. But the dog in that cage needed a place to hide. Yeah, sorry. So something to think about. For, for a lot of these things, like some of them are basics and all animals need them, but you also need to address that individual animal's needs. Um, that animal that was in that particular cage wasn't going to jump anywhere. He didn't want to be seen. Um, and our fear was that if we put him in a carrier, he was so fearful that that is all he would do. Um, and getting him out of the carrier would have been difficult. So to address that individual dog's needs, covering the front of his kennel was his best option. The back side of his kennel was left open. That was a double-sided run. So again, think about it. But yes, certainly for some dogs, all it's going to encourage is jumping. So for that dog, that wouldn't have been ideal. He may, and that, the dog that likes to jump may love having a carrier. Because then they can be on top of it. So yes. So the question was, if you provide a carrier, should you also provide a bed outside of the carrier? I would say if you have room in your kennel, give them choice and put one inside and one outside. Um, and again, when you go through in your cleaning, if it's not dirty, let them keep it. You know, we talk about spot cleaning for cats. It's not a sanitation lecture, but I'm a nerd, and that's my second favorite thing after behavior. Um, you know, we talk about spot cleaning cats, and the reason we can do that is because we don't physically enter the kennels, and so we're not, we don't worry about what we would bring into the kennel. With dogs, it's a little different. Many times we have to walk in, and so we worry about what we bring in. So that's why we feel like we need to fully disinfect kennels. But in a lot of shelters, dogs leave their kennels. They walk all over. And so what you're bringing in when you're cleaning, it doesn't matter because they're already being exposed to it outside of their run. So if you have you know, animals that have been vaccinated for five days, they're healthy, it's OK to leave their bedding and everything in their kennel, or not even clean that side if it's not dirty. Um, so, you know, a lot of people are like, well, it's more laundry. And I'm like, if it's not dirty, don't clean it. So, does that make sense? But if you're without room, you know, you adjust. But hopefully most dog runs are big enough that you can have both. I have my ideals, and then, you know, we have our acceptables. Um, so, now that we have our dogs happy in their primary enclosures while they're staying with us, we want to talk about enrichment. So, how can we enrich their experience even more both while they're in their kennels and when they get to come out. Um, so these are some, um, I just want to talk about, this is actually in the ASD guidelines for standards of care. And this just hits home to me, and that's that enrichment should be given the same significance as other components of animal care, such as nutrition and veterinary care, and should not be considered optional. Okay, so if you guys remember nothing else from me today, remember that enrichment is not an option. Okay, we have to meet their needs. It shouldn't be an afterthought. Um, but things to think about. What can your shelter handle? Okay. Um, how much time does it need? How much does it cost? Always comes back to cost. 
What can you do that will be the most valuable? What barriers exist? How can we break down those barriers? Who's going to do it? How is it going to improve? Um, and then how can you demonstrate that it's making a difference so you can get more support for your program? So again, we're going to start with our cats. Think about what's normal behavior for your cat, um, for any cat, and then how can you meet those needs? Um, that might be my cat up in the corner there, sleeping in front of the fire. Okay, they like to forage and hunt, right? I loved this idea. It's just a muffin tin. The cat was going crazy in it, bouncing the ball between his muffin tin. Cat grass, um, that's just an empty, it's free. It's an empty um, glove box that they put a ball in. So the cat's not just playing with the ball, he's playing with it in the box. This cat loved this video. It was just a spider walking across the screen. But it was, <laughs> he didn't care. He thought it was awesome. Would it entertain him for days? No. But let me tell you, for the you know, 35 minutes that he sat in front of that screen, he couldn't have been happier. Um, windows are great. Letting cats watch out a window. Um, um, fish tanks are great. Um, anything that lets them, you know, cats like to hunt, let's be honest. Um, you know, there's very safe ways to let them do it. Grooming. Let cats need room to be able to groom themselves. It's also great to have areas where um, volunteers can go in and also provide the grooming for cats that enjoy it. <laughs> um, grooming opportunities for the cats while they're in your shelter. Scratching. Totally normal. Totally, um, you know, physically beneficial to cats to be able to um, to use their claws. Have you guys seen the, the scratch and stretch? They're like a dollar. Um, they can stay with the cat while they're in their shelter. You can send it home with them or you can throw it away when they're done. It's great though because it goes on the door. It doesn't take up any floor space. Um, and there's also lots of um, people get scared about you know things that can't be disinfected between cats. Again, lots of cleaning products that will be effective against disinfecting this when the cat um, goes home and it will be exposed to another cat. Toys, love them. Um, so we do know that cats like consistency and familiarity, right? But I think we can also say that what happens when you give your cat a new toy? So excited, right? So we want to give cats both. So we want to spot clean and let them keep what's familiar to them. But you know what? Give them a new toy every day. Make something new because otherwise they're going to get bored. It's going to be the same humdrum day after day. So this was actually a toy schedule that was put together by Jacksonville. Um, different ideas, cheap ideas to, you know, change out um, toys for the cat. This one was great. It's, they're, they're, um, you can either use toilet paper or um, paper towel. Um, and you cut them up and you can fold them like origami and put um, catnip inside of them. Awesome. Doesn't cost anything. So lots of fun stuff that you can do. Um, for cats to change it up a little bit just to keep them excited. You can clicker train cats, people. Great, great um, program for to get volunteers involved in. And what a cool trick. Like, okay, so it's a black cat in a shelter, but this one can give a high five. Awesome. That cat's going home. Out of cage time. Um, my favorite, this is in Oakland, the catio. So they this is this is the catio. So it's outdoor space where volunteers can take cats to let them hang out. Awesome. If it's not always a beautiful day, maybe like today in Wisconsin, you can have rooms where you can take the cats to give them out of cage time. Completely appropriate. Um, you know, clean the area between cats, but let them hang out outside of their cage. Um, they love to play. Um, bubbles, blowing bubbles is a great way to give them um, interactions. Um, all sorts of games you can play with cats to, you know, keep them moving physically, keep their minds moving, um, and a great, great job for volunteers. Okay, this one, uh, this always makes me sad. Because <laughs> um, how many times have you guys seen this? Like, they're sick. They don't get to play. Really? That's not fair. <laughs> they're already stressed. They're already sick. And, like, and now they're just going to be ignored. Except when someone comes in to give them meds or feed them or disrupt their kennel. Like, really? That might be kind of upsetting after a few days. So it is OK to socialize sick cats, OK? Again, have your protocol for how to do it. It's even fine. This is one shelter's option. This is in Sacramento. 
Um, they have an out of cage time for their URI cats. Okay? The cats get to get out of their cage, they get to stretch, they get to interact with people, and then they clean it, and then the next cat can go in there. Obviously, you're not putting your healthy cats in here. This is strictly for the URI ward. So there's options. Okay, dogs. But it's on the line. Eating. I love this shelter. This is what their kitchen looked like. So they were a small shelter. They had a lot of one-on-one -on -one care. But eat, look at that. Each dog had a different way of eating to meet their needs, both dietary, so for their medical needs, plus to meet their needs. Like this is just a bowl turned upside down, but it has the thing in the middle to slow the dog down. This one, this is going to provide enrichment for a long time. This was one of their more active dogs. And all their food was served in a con. So lots of ways to be creative that aren't, um, that aren't very expensive. And I know, I just realized this morning, I didn't put anything in about the open paw program, because I know Dr. Newberry talked to you about it already. Um, but something to check out about um, dogs being fed by hand, or even receiving treats by hand. Lots of cool stuff that's happening in shelters with that. Um, chewing. Chewing is a very natural, necessary thing for dogs to do that provide a ton of enrichment. Um, rope, soaking a rope toy in chicken broth and freezing it awesome, inexpensive chew toy that you can throw in the wash and it can be used again. Kongs, lots of people use them. You can put these on your wish list. They can be disinfected. Lots of great options for chewing. Um, these are just plastic bottles that we filled with different treats and then capped off with peanut butter. Cheap, easy to use. You'll want to monitor. We don't need any foreign bodies, but great enrichment for dogs um, if that works into your program. Kongs, um, you can get donated seconds for your shelter, have a program on how to stuff them. Um, and look at, I mean, seriously, that dog is happy with his Kong stuck in the corner. Um, toys, uh, you can get cheap stuffed toys. I go to the Goodwill and buy um, toys for my dog. Lots of um, tennis places will donate old tennis balls. Dogs don't care if they bounce funny. Um, just remember supervision when you're using stuff like this. I've also, there was a, um, shelter that was getting old hose is, um, fire hoses, really durable fire hoses that donated from the local shelter and they'd cut them up, stuff them, and make um, um, toys for their dogs that way. So tons of options to provide dogs toys. Dogs like to forage too. Um, this was at one shelter. This dog's food bowl was actually in that box because he needed enrichment. This dog, he was a, um, a pointer, so he was a little stir crazy in his kennel. And but that's how he got to eat. That's how he provided enrichment. Um, let him rip open a garbage. These are just um, lunch sacks filled with kibble um, to let the dogs um, rip up and play with. So, yeah. I don't, oh, sorry, the question is, aren't we teaching them to rip open kids' lunch snacks once they get home? And I would reply, I don't think you need to teach a dog that. <laughs> I'm pretty sure a dog is going to know that they need to open, that they're going to rip open a lunch sack when they get home. So this is, this is something that was given to them purposefully. So, you know, it's a treat that they know they're going to get. So that would be my response. Um, so. Again, it's a training tool. It's an enrichment tool um, that helps. <laughs> Again, grooming for these guys. Um, lots of things you can have volunteers do. Um, and again, providing dogs um, um, is another way that they can get um, positive interactions with people. Because um, really, there's nothing more sad than you know the shelter where the only interactions the dogs get with people is cleaning, feeding, and medication. So any positive interaction, is, again, as long as the dog enjoys it, any positive interactions we can provide the dogs is great. Training, um, again, I do have something about this. I'm, whoo -whoo. Um, I'm seeing this in more and more shelters, and it just makes me so happy um, having treats on the door that people can give animals. It is awesome to walk up to a kennel and not be barked at and have the dog sit. When you want to get a dog out of your shelter, that is one of the easiest ways to do it, and it is not hard to train. Um, 
Center for Shelter Dogs has a great write-up on how to get this going in your program, or just Google Open Paw. Um, tons of wonderful, wonderful programs out there, and really easy to get started um, in a shelter. And there's a write-up from Animal, uh, if you go to Animal Sheltering Magazine, on how to get that started in your shelter. And this is one thing I really want to stress, because um, well, I think a lot of times when we think of getting dogs out, we think about, okay, we got to go play. we got to go burn off energy, which is awesome. But also, dogs really like quiet time. I mean, every night at our house, at night, once everyone's eaten, we all sit on the couch. You know, and who is, like, can you imagine walking through a shelter and seeing a volunteer sitting here reading with a dog at their feet? Like, people can picture that in their house. You know, and some people may not want to walk through a shelter and see the dog that needs six hours of exercise. <laughs> you know, they want the dog that likes quiet time. So it's also really important, um, you know, and a lot of volunteers may like that better. And they're thinking they have to come to the shelter and walk 27 animals. So just something to think about, that it's not all about um, running, even though we know they love that too. So having places for both in a shelter, if you can, is really important. If you really want to be fancy, you get a place like that with a retractable roof. You don't need it. All right, this is a great program um, that Boulder Valley Humane Society started. People could come, volunteers could come when they were going on a hike and pick out a dog for the day to take with them. And then when they come back, they do a write-up on how the dog did and what um, um, things that happened on the trail. And it's just another way to express the dog's personality. Plus they get exercise, they wear a little vest on the trail um, that said, adopt me. So it's just, um, you know, if you can, like, it's just another great program to get dogs out and about and in the community, visible in the community. Playgroups. This has been a big discussion in the um, shelter world. It scares a lot of people. It, is, it excites a lot of people. Um, I would be in that category. <laughs> um, it has to be done right. Like, I'm not, like, you need a protocol for it. You need training for it. It needs to be a thoughtful process, but it can be amazing. Um, and it's a place for, it's a time for dogs. And I think that that's what's really important. I think a lot of the problems come is when people try and interact with the dogs when they're in their play group. It's a time for the dogs. It's a time for the dogs to learn from each other. It's a time for the dogs to interact with each other. And it can be a really, really, really positive program. It's a great way for adopters to see the animal and the behavior of their animals. Um, but there need to be rules. Um, um, the Center for Shelter Dogs has a great manual on how to do it and how they do it in their shelter. So um, and you, need a, you need a good place to do it. But um, I think it's a really thoughtful program that can be instituted really well in some shelters. So something to think about. I think we're going to hear more about it. Um, in, in, as we progress. I think Dr. Newberry mentioned this, the Doggy Wellness Hour. Um, awesome program um, that this shelter found to meet the needs of their animals. Um, it's a quiet hour for all the dogs in the shelter that the staff gets to participate in. So it's really positive for the staff and for the dogs. If you go on their website still, it says that they are closed for one hour. I think it's from 2 to 3 in the afternoon. That they're like, come visit our cats, because this is when we dedicate our time our dogs. Sound is a huge, huge thing. Again, I talked about the doors and opening. Um, can, shelters are loud. They're very loud. This is a great program. You can go. Um, it's free for shelters. They can get an MP3 player with classical music on it. Um, you get this whole setup for your shelter to play music um, throughout your shelter. And so. Um, just one more thing that you can do to make it a more pleasant environment for the visitors in your shelter and for the animals. And my final comment will be on monitoring. Um, providing enrichment is a great way, as you're interacting with them, as you're seeing changes, to monitor. You know, make notes. Um, anything we can learn about the animals to help make a successful adoption is awesome. So <laughs> I'm stressed and have some running poop. You know, great, now we know. You know, and this is because someone had them out um, and, um, you know, now they know how to meet her needs. So, um, just a thought, since you're going to be, it, 
we're interacting with the animals more and more, and with each interaction, we learn a little bit more. So, um, that's it, yes. Oh, sorry. I didn't talk about feeding wet food or timing of feeding for cats. How important is that? Um, well, I read an article once that if you really want to feed a cat naturally, as they would prefer to be eaten, you would have to feed your cat 13 times a day. Awesome. <laughs> I would, many shelters would not take me up on that offer. So, as many, t so, but from that, I could take that I would find it, I would conclude that cats would find it enriching to receive food at multiple times a day. So, um, but again, you have to look at what can your shelter provide, um, who can provide it, um, and cats also have their own preferences, right? So, again, that's where the monitoring can come in. If you see that this cat loves his canned food and his dry food, awesome, then let's find a way to make that happen, you know? I think, I don't know that, okay, I know there isn't a study that shows, you know, providing canned food in the afternoon to all your cats will increase adaptability and reduce stress. I think it's a good idea if it works in your shelter. Um, I know. <laughs> So a benefit would be that it, um, it's a great time for monitoring. It's a great thing. I mean, it's, it's a schedule, something for the cat to look forward to. Um, so if it is possible in a shelter, I think it can be a great program. Any other questions? Did you guys learn something that you could take back to a shelter and be like super impressed with hands off them by your very simple way to provide enrichment? Awesome. Thanks, guys.